Welcome back. In the last video, we were talking about the idea of what multiple regression is and the uh, ways that we assess collinearity uh, between our, our different x variables before building up uh, to more uh, building up more complex models. So I want to talk through our, our again our focusing on our example of of trying to predict soil temperature. Uh, where we left off from our univariate regressions, our, our models that only had one x at a time, was that all of them were significant. So uh, you know we we don't at this stage reject any of them. If if some of them came back as not significant, uh, we would be pretty hesitant to continue to include them in more complex models, unless we had some sort of exploratory analysis suggesting that the reason they weren't significant was because they have some weird interaction with another variable that we're going to need to account for later. Um, so you can continue pull things forward if they're not significant, but in general, you, you want to have a pretty, pretty strong argument for why you think that there's something there that the univariate model missed. In this case, they were all significant. The other thing I'm going to note is that if we go back and look at the correlation, TA had the strongest correlation. I didn't show all the R-squareds. Uh, TA also had the highest R-squared. Uh, and so because that is the one that has the strongest correlation, the one that has the, the most explanatory power, uh, that's the model I'm going to start with. And so all of my multivariate models are going to always include air temperature because it was the strongest predictor of what I, of so far in my data set. And then I'm going to try exploring is there any, can I explain any of the additional variability in the data by adding additional explanatory variables beyond air temperature? Cool. Uh, next, remember from our, our, but from looking at the collinearity that RGL, which is our, our long wave thermal radiation, was very collinear with air temperature. So I'm going to actually decide not to include that in the higher model. So I have two things that are very tightly related to each other. One of them is a better predictor than the other. Air temperature was a better predictor of soil temperature than long waves. So I'm going to move forward working with air temperature uh, because and, and drop long wave thermal radiation because, like I said, it's collinear, and uh, it, but it wasn't as good a predictor, which suggests that you know maybe the reason that long waves is showing up uh, in the first place was because maybe it was also related to air temperature. Uh, also noting that that VPD has a strong correlation with air temperature, so we might. Uh, be careful about pulling that forward. Um, and we also noted that, that uh, again, uh, solar radiation, RG, and VPD were somewhat collinear. Uh, between the two, um, the solar radiation had a stronger correlation with uh, soil temperature uh, than, than the VPD is. So what I'm going to end up doing at this point is I'm going to narrow this down <clears throat> to this three set of candidates. I'm going to continue to look at soil water content uh, and wind speed because they weren't really correlated with anything else, particularly they weren't correlated with air temperature. Um, and I'm going to continue forward with uh, solar radiation uh, because uh, in the choice between VPD and uh, solar radiation, uh, VPD was, uh, like I said, uh, had a stronger correlation with air temperature, which we're already including in the model, and uh, between uh, VPD and, and uh, solar radiation, uh, solar radiation was a better predictor. And then again, I drop long wave radiation because it was fairly collinear. And so uh, the, the dropping of VPD was, was not strictly based on its correlation with air temperature, but based on these multiple factors, you know, the other things that were correlated with were also better predictors of air temperature. So all kind of suggesting that maybe it was just kind of coming along for the ride with other things and, and may not be, not, not, might not be having a strong direct effect. Okay, so with that done, I'm gonna then go through and start fitting uh, multiple regression models. I'm going to start with two variable models. And so I can, for example, fit a relationship, a model where I fit, predict uh, soil temperature as a function of air temperature and wind speed, 
uh, using this syntax, you know, soil temperature tilde air temperature plus wind speed. And I've also done here that I, something that I didn't do in the, in the univariate regression is I wrote comma dat. So the, um, in linear models, if you want to reference variables within a data frame without including the like, you know, dat dollar sign ts, dat dollar sign ta, dat dollar sign ws, you can pat, say that I'm working with this whole data frame as the second argument. And then now that LM knows you're working with that whole data frame, you can reference the variables within that data frame without including the, you know, the dat dollar sign in front of it. Uh, and the syntax for adding a second variable is, is just additive, you know, TA plus wind speed. And so that implies to R that I want the model that has an intercept. Intercept is always there by default. In fact, if you want to get rid of the intercept, you have to put a minus one in the model, which basically means drop the intercept term. Uh, so there's always an intercept and then the slopes again are implicit. So you're, you're writing in a model that says intercept plus slope TA plus slope wind speed is predicting uh, so, uh, soil temperature. And, and likewise, the assumption of normal residual error is built in to the linear model as a default. Uh, when I do this fit, I get a summary table back that's very similar to what we looked at before. Again, we're seeing the formula. We're seeing the, the distribution, the, kind of some of the, the overall error statistics uh, from the residuals. Uh, we're seeing the coefficients. and uh, now, because we have um, two x's, we see you know, two rows for two slopes in the coefficients table. So we have an intercept, the slope for TA, the slope for WS. We have the numerical values of those things. We have uh, the standard errors, so the uncertainties in those parameter estimates. From the uncertainties in those parameter estimates and the means, we derive a t-statistic, and then we use the t-distribution to calculate a p-value. Mm -hmm. From those, and again, we flag the significant co significance codes as this helps us just know at quick glance that the p-value is between 0 and 0 0.001. Uh, we can then look at our residual standard error. And if we go back and compare that to the TA alone model, we see that, it's, that the residual standard error is smaller, but not by a lot. Um, we see that there are now more data points that have been dropped because of missingness, because now there's missingness in the wind speed and the TA and TS. Uh, we see our, our multiple R squared has gone up a little bit, but not a lot. Um, and our F statistic, our overall test of the model is again now uh, still highly significant. Uh, I can do this process of exploring uh, bivariate models uh, for uh, not just wind speed, but I can do this again for uh, the other variables I was interested in, uh, so water content and solar radiation, and look to see here I'm using R squared as an assessment of the overall fit of a model. I want to really emphasize an important point, and this will come up when we talk about model selection uh, more explicitly in a little bit. Uh, when you are comparing models of equal complexity, which are models that have the same number of coefficients, you can use R squared to tell them apart. Uh, but if you're comparing models that have different numbers of predictors, you can't use R squared to tell them apart. So I can't, you know, so whenever I add, if I add more covariates, my R squared will always get better. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I've written a better model because, you know, you can, you have to yeah, potentially penalize models for being overly complex. And we'll get into how we do that later. But at this stage, we can look and see that, um, that wind speed actually gave us the largest increase uh, in R squared. You know, and if we went, if I quickly went back um, to the univariate regression, you know, the, the univariate regression with just air temperature had an R squared of uh, 0.813. And now, Uh, you know, our, our G went from 0.813 to 0.817. So, uh, you know, an increase in R squared of 0.004. Uh, <laughs> so water content increased R squared by 0.006. Uh, and, you know, 
wind speed and increase it by like 0.1 something. So all three of these covariates increase the R squared, but they only increase it a very small amount. So the additional explanatory variable power is not very large. That said, um, the, the p-values were actually significant for all these models. Um, <clears throat> and that's, be, again, an important point, the, the, the power, our ability to detect effects and get, see their significance and uh, importance are not necessarily the same size. The effect size and the, the R-squared the R or the power are not the same thing. So because we had you know, 13,000 observations, we could show that uh, we could detect the effect of these, two th of these additional variables, all three of them, even though the effects were actually very small. Um, so they're not necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean they're worth worrying about just because they're significant. Um, yeah, so the last, yeah, they, they all, okay. So next I can move on to more complex models. So again, uh, in, in two variable models, the best model was air temperature plus wind speed. So if I want to build a three variable model, I'm going to start with my best two variable model, air speed, uh, air temperature and wind speed, and then explore the value of adding additional variables. And my, my remaining variables would be soil water content and, and solar radiation. So I could, do, I could do two more models, air temperature, wind speed, and soil water, and then air temperature, wind speed, and solar radiation. So if I go on and do that, uh, all of them were significant. Um, the one air temperature, wind speed, and so water content was slightly better than air temperature, wind speed, and uh, uh, solar radiation. So I would then take that and then I uh, can do a model that has all four. Um, and you know, here's the, the summary table for the, mo the parameter has the model that's all four. And we can look at this and we can see that. Uh, all the parameters were significant. They were all highly significant. The R squared went up to 0.838. Um, and uh, yeah, but the thing you'll also notice is that the, uh, the, the air temperature is clearly having a, the strongest effect. It, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's T statistic is, is you know, quite large uh, compared to the others. And, and the increase in R squared for each of these additional variables has been fairly uh, modest. Um, so that leads us now we fit, we, we know what our, we know our overall model is statistically significant, uh, that has all of our predictors. We know what our best fitting univariate model was, our best variate, fitting bivariate or two variable model, three variable model, four variable. So we know what our best fitting model is at, at each of those tiers. I want to next kind of, uh, in the next video, we're going to talk about model selection, which is how do we tell those apart? Cool.